we're going to learn a little bit about self-control. Amen? Amen? Before I do that, I'd like to take a quick survey. How many of you have procrastinated more than you wanted to this week? Show by raising... Let me see if I raise the hands. Okay. Some of you are slow in getting a hand up there. I can see that right now. Okay. How many of you have exercised less this week than you wish you had? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How many of you have eaten more than you wish you had? Yeah. These things, these are things that we know that we should do, or these are things that we know we shouldn't do. And it takes a lot of self-control to make yourself do those sort of things. So today I want to talk about self-control, but self-control not only affects adults, but it affects children all the way around. As a matter of fact, I have a, a cute little video, <clears throat> and I've shown this video before, but not in this context. So go ahead and watch the film right here, if you would, please. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. Go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> wow, huh? How many of you guys really felt for those kids, didn't you? They look like puppy dogs, some of them. You know, it's just, it's just amazing. Um, we all struggle. It's hard. Whoever said self-control is easy is not telling the truth, okay? It is very hard sometimes. And we look at that and we think, you know, well, I could have I held out for that. Well, obviously we could. But as adults, there's certain things that we fall victim to. And we, 
I want you to notice this. Every one of those kids wanted the extra marshmallow, didn't they? They did. They did everything in their power to make sure they got that extra marshmallow, except for that one girl. But anyway, she knew what she wanted, okay? <laughs> but everyone else wanted it. And they knew that the long-term goal was something to look forward to, but I, they had to give up something for right now in order to be able to do that. Humans are the same way. Adults are the same way. I mean, if it's not something we want, it's something like maybe you want to get up early. Who has a very hard time getting up early in the morning? Okay, for you guys who procrastinate and constantly hit the snooze button again and again and again, they have created a special clock. It's called Clocky. Go ahead and bring that up. This is Clocky right here. And what it is, once you set the clock, when the alarm goes off, you know that you need something to help you to have self-control to get up out of bed. So Clocky, as soon as it starts buzzing, it takes off running. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes the loudest, obnoxious sound, and you have to go and find this thing underneath the table, underneath your bed, whatever it is, like, i got to shut this thing up. Well, by the time you finally find Clocky, <laughs> you're awake. So this is something to help you. Sometimes we need that, don't we, as adults? Here's another clock. This didn't quite make it. Go ahead. This one is called a, what is it called? A snooze and lose. There it is. You know what this clock does? It taps into your bank account. This is true clock. <laughs> And it taps into your bank account right there. And what it does, if you hit the snooze, every time you hit the snooze, it donates so much money to a particular uh, <laughs> charity that you do not like. <laughs> so right there, every time you do it right there, we have a total of $832 that's being to donated. And for some reason, they're giving it to the GOP. They don't like the GOP. But anyway, there are certain things that we have to do to force ourselves to have the self-control because we sometimes don't have it within us, do we? Self-control is very hard. I want to read to you our scripture that we've been studying. It's found in 2 Peter, verse one, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, and it says this. You can just read along here. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us a great and precious promise. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Here they are. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith. Remember we talked about faith is the foundation, faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the person of Jesus Christ, nothing else. That's what saves you. That is the foundation. On that foundation, supplement your faith. In other words, add to your faith a generous provision of moral excellence, virtue, the things of God, qualities of God. And moral excellence, you're to add knowledge. We, we talked about knowledge last week. And this week, to add to the knowledge, self-control. Self-control. God wants every one of his children to have self-control. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. That's how you know that you belong to God is when you have the self-control inside of you. You may have never had it before. How many of you guys can attest to that? You never had it before until you came to Jesus and all of a sudden Jesus is doing this work inside of you. He says, I've given you self-control. I've given you, I like what that scripture says, he's given us every spiritual blessing. He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. Hallelujah. And so God wants us to have self-control. When I started studying self-control, man, I tell you what, you could speak on this for weeks. You really, really can. It is a very in-depth thing. So I'm just going to try and give you a gloss over the whole thing because we have other things that we'll go on to next week. But self-control is this. Self-control is the ability to control one's emotions. Have you guys have ever seen uh, some people who just kind of just work their emotions up? They just live off their emotions and they just like, it's like, well, are you doing this on purpose? Is this an act? Self-control, God wants us to be able to control our own emotions, not the emotions to control us. We're to control our behavior. We're to be able to control our thoughts. Self-control. God wants us to control our thoughts even. Isn't that amazing? You know, sometimes we think, well, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But God knows what's going on up here. Imagination that's gone wild. Imagination that's gone on unholy things. God knows that. And he says, I want you to control your mind. I want you to control your thinking, not just your hands, not just your mouth. I want you to control your thinking as well. Your desires, being in control of oneself. Now, the opposite of that, obviously, the lack of self-control is linked. Listen to this. The lack of self-control is linked to a couple things. Number one, addictions. Those who lack self-controls, they have addictions. 
substance dependencies, procrastinations. These are the people who lack that control, be able to uh, rule their own body, to govern their own thoughts. Those who lack the uh, self-control have greater rates of bad health, sexually transmitted diseases. The things that we eat, the things that we consume in our bodies, the way we take care of ourselves. We just don't, contr we don't have the self-control to do the things that we know we should, and we do the things that we shouldn't do. And because of that, people who lack self-control have health issues big time. Financial problems. Debt. Got to have it now. You know, the, the credit card. Got to have it now. Don't, don't put off now. You know, don't put it off. You can have it now. Don't wait to then. We'll give you the payments that you can make it all, all the time. You can have it right now. Eating disorders, crime, gambling, and more. These are all things associated with a person who lacks self-control. That's why God wants us to be in control of ourselves. Amen? What a, what a terrible witness it would be for someone who had all these traits, all these things, all these diseases, all these financial problems, the disorders, and the addictions. Man, that's not a person of freedom, is it? All because of their self, lack of self-control, something else controlled them. Can I say that one more time? All because of a person's lack of self-control, something else controlled them. God says, I don't want anything to control you. I created you to be governor of your own heart, of your own mind. Matter of fact, even Jesus, even God himself doesn't want to control you in that sense, does he? He gives us the choice, which is amazing. He gives us a choice, and he wants us to use it to control ourselves as well. We know what's best, yet we fight it all the time. We fight the things that we know is good for us, and it's hard why is self-control so difficult at times? Well, to answer this question, uh, I'm going to have to give you uh, an understanding where the struggle lies, okay? Ready? Matter of fact, for this, I'm going to need, uh, I'm going to need that right there, those papers, and I'm also going to need three people to help me. I'm going to ask Todd Brooks if you would come on up. You, these are people who have no idea it's coming. <laughs> uh, Todd Brooks, you're just staring at me. You need self-control and get up and come towards me. Oh, that's me controlling you. I'm sorry. Come here. Uh, also, Bill Donowski and Barry Freisinger. <laughs> Everybody loves it when Barry Freisinger comes up. All right. What we're going to do, I'm going to have you guys stand in front of this. I'll move this right here. Now, why do people have issues with self-control? Why is it hard? Todd, you sit right, right here. And Bill, you sit, stand in the middle, please. And we'll have Barry over here. Now, what we're going to talk about is there's three different things. As human beings, we're not just a body. We're not just this group of handsome, <laughs> disgusted-looking men. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, Barry, he was going like this. <laughs> but we are more than this. The Bible declares that we are more than what you just see right here. But the thing that we do see is this. This guy here is going to represent... Will you hold that for me, please? Thank you very much. You're going to represent the flesh, okay? We'll just put that right there. And a mighty fine-looking flesh it is. Okay. <laughs> flesh. That's our body. That's the physical things. That's the thing that has all the senses that knows what's going on around it. Also, when God created us, he gave us what's called a soul. Bill's got soul. <laughs> How you doing, Bill? Thank you. He's got a lot of self-control. He wants to hit me right now. <laughs> and then, of course, we are also what's called spirit. Now, I'm just going to talk a, just briefly a little bit about these things and what they do for us. And these are guys that represent it. Okay, the body. Todd Brooks here. A wonderful creation of God. Amen? The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully... Yeah, <laughs> we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's just amazing science in the last hundred years of what they found out what the body is all about and how intricate it is and how developed and how smart and thought out this body is. There's no way this thing could have happened by accident. No way. <laughs> <laughs> the chances of this thing happening by accident is the same chances of a tornado going through a junkyard and when it leaves, there's a 747 with all the wheels, with all the flaps, with all the gas, with all the seats, with all the controls, with all the valves, with everything all intact. No, we are fearfully, and I might add, beautifully and wonderfully made. <laughs> the physical world, it lives in a, the physical body, it lives in a physical world, so it's in touch with the things that's around it. It has needs. Todd here has needs. He also has wants. What are the needs of Todd? Well, food. Amen. Food, <laughs> food, water, sleep, 
uh, shelter, all these things. And it also has wants. The wants of the body is, some of the things is sex, and, the, and it wants its way all the time. I know, I, I skimmed over that real fast because I embarrassed myself. Okay, it wants its way all the time, okay? It does. Am I speaking the truth here, ma'am? Okay, anyway, this guy, the body wants its way. It's got to have its way. It fights for its way all the time. I remember growing up, I fought to get my way all the time. Mom made sure that I never won. It feels, you know, the, the motto of the body is this. Man, if it feels good, just do it. Give in to your cravings. It's great. Give in. It hates pain. Oh, it hates pain. If it has to work for something, like exercising to develop itself, I ain't doing that. I'm the body. I don't want <laughs> It doesn't like pain, any form of it. And let me tell you something else about the body. It's decaying and it's dying. The body is. Yes, the body is. It's decaying and dying. It's always, every one of our bodies right now that God has given us, it's in a, it's a second law of thermodynamics. Everything goes from greater to less. We are dying. We are decaying. It won't last forever. Okay, then out of this, God also has put a soul in man. What is the soul? Well, this is the soul right here. The soul is our mind. It's our consciousness. It's, it's our thoughts. It's, it's our emotions. It's who you and I are. You know, the things that makes Bill, Bill, the things that makes everyone love Bill, that is his soul. That's what everyone's in love with. They may, Marilyn's in love with the body, but she's also in love with this guy's soul and who he is. <laughs> and it's who we are. It's our humor. It's our love. It's our individuality. The soul, now listen to this. The body is material. It's not spiritual. It's not immaterial. But the soul is material and immaterial. It, it kind of transcends both realms right there. It can go in both directions. The soul will continue forever. When the body dies, the soul will continue. Now, when you guys look at this, yeah. <laughs> when you guys look at this up here, think of this as one big body, okay? Right, and right now I'm in the middle. I'm, I'm the little parasite, okay? Right now, this is one big body right here. That's what we're looking at. So the soul will continue forever. And the soul links the, the body with the spirit that is over there. And matter of fact, the soul is also what gives the body its life. You take away the soul, the body dies. The body is no longer there. It's no longer living. Now we move over here to the spirit. The spirit, God breathed into clay. When God made man, he made him out of clay. He made him out of the dust of the earth. And the Bible says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that life, that life was last forever. That life is what God, that's, we're in the image of God. That life is the spirit right here. It will last forever. This is God breathed. And it's a part of us that has the relationship with God. These cannot have the relationship with God, but this can really have the relationship with God. It will continue forever, and when born again, it seeks God. But I got to tell you something. Something happened with the spirit that is, involves every one of us. When Adam and Eve, were, they were in the garden, God created them. God had a loving relationship with the body. But then he gave this one thing. He says, look, in the middle of of this garden, I'm planting a tree. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. I don't want you to touch those things. I don't want you to eat those things. Don't take of it. You know why? Because God has given us choice. Without choice, we can't love God. Without choice, God doesn't love us. I want you to know that because we now have the choice to love him. So God loves us very much. Genesis 2.17 says this, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Adam and Eve ate of, of that fruit, but their bodies did not die. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God kicked them out. So what died? This is the part of the body that died. It was the spirit. It no longer had that communion with God, no longer had that connection with God that God so, so much desires in every one of our lives. Amen? So that's broken. That's why the Bible says that sin separates us from God. When the spirit dies, we do not have that communion with God. We do not have that, and we're separated from God. Uh, but God does not want to leave our spirit dead. He made a way so that our spirit could come alive again. Isn't that amazing? He made a way so that he can have communion again. He worked it out. He planned us ahead of time so that we can have communion with him once again. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says this, and this is going to be up on the screen. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, 
He gave us life. Can you say that with me? He gave us life. Amen. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you and I have been saved. Isn't that amazing? It's only by his grace that you and I have been saved. See, the fact that the spirit was dead, there was no longing for God. The soul and the flesh had no longing, had no inkling, had no desire for God, had no unction, didn't want anything to do with God. So, but God says, look, I'm going to make a way so that you can. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the only way that this body could be saved is if God drew it. See, without the spirit here, the soul won't seek out God. You hear me? Amen. Without the spirit, the flesh won't seek out God. It will only seek out the things for itself as it's dealing with the mind. And the mind finds out ways to satisfy the flesh, how to take care of it, how to feed it, how to meet all of its needs. This will never seek God. It will never want to be saved. It's only the spirit that can be. And so that's why God had to make a way. God had to make a way. God had to bring life. Who's ever heard of being born again? Born again, that's what it's talking about. See, what happens is, for, when, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, I, I kind of skipped over the scripture here, but I'll read it one more time. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. So God is constantly drawing. How does he do it? Well, if the Spirit's dead, he can't communicate with it. So he's constantly working out in the world around us. We see all creation and the, and the flesh is walking around, da, 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 da. and here we have the mind, the brain, and soul. He's looking around going, wow, look, look at those stars, body. Stop a second. I want to look up. Looks up at the stars, look at, looks at the sky, looks at the grass, and starts to wonder, where did this all come from? That's why God created the creation the way he did. The Bible says that all creation cries out to him, and we are without excuse when we look at creation. And so the body is walking around, the brain's looking around, noticing these things, and it's drawn. It's going, what is going on? What is going on? That's God drawing it. God also draws the body and the, right here through the word of God. He also draws the body through Jesus Christ and through those believers around him. So constantly God is wooing. Constantly God is drawing. So we have to make it easy for people to come to Jesus. Amen? Whatever it takes, make it easy so that they can see the things of God. So when the body and the soul, they see God and they understand what's going on, then the brain makes a decision. You know what? This is good. I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And when he does that, the Bible says that God brings the spirit back to life. Boom, he steps forward. He's powerful. He's alive. The whole person is alive. Now the whole person can seek God. Now, and the soul, by the way, the soul, the Bible says that we're to renew our mind through his word. The soul is still, it's still got the old fleshly desires. It still has those wants and those, it thinks it has those needs, but it still has those wants. But the Bible says that we can renew our mind. We can make the brain, the soul come alive through the God's word. And so that's what happens right here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's the problem. The spirit is made alive in Jesus, and now it desires the things of God. Now the soul is being renewed by the word of God, but <laughs> the flesh here, it's not saved. It will never be saved. Your flesh will never be saved. It's going to die and it's going to return to dust from which it came from. Amen? And so the thing is, the flesh here, being as big as it is and as strong as it is, it kind of dictates a lot of the things right here. See, when the spirit comes alive, it's like a babe, right? I didn't choose you for that reason. But it's kind of like a babe. <laughs> but the thing is this, the flesh is strong, so we have to do some work. That's where the self-control comes in. We have to not let the flesh rule our lives anymore because remember, the flesh, it desires some things that are not holy. They're not wholesome, amen? And when the flesh gives in, if we give in to their flesh all the time, it will ruin your life. How many of you guys know that to be true by the world around you that you see? If you give in to your flesh and you live by its wants, you live by its dictates, you live by its demands, you will be destroyed and your life will be nothing, no power whatsoever. You'll be lost, you'll be destroyed. And this is where the devil comes to attack. The devil doesn't come to attack this. He'll come to attack the mind and stuff, but more, he will go everything, he'll do everything he can to throw at the body right here at your desires and your wants and all those sort of things like that. So until the flesh dies, we will continually to have struggle. See, even though, this, even though God has saved this, even though God has brought him to life and this body is saved, this body will continue to struggle as long as he's alive. <laughs> as long as he's alive, it will always have that fight, always have that struggle like you've seen the kids right up there, the self-control, can't do it, can't do it. It's all because of that. Until this body is dead, it will always be like that. Amen? That's why we are to grow in the knowledge, and that's why we're to grow in God's word, and we're to add to our knowledge self-control. Amen? Why don't you guys give them a hand? They can have a seat. Thank you very much, guys.
Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Spirit. Even after salvation, think of this. Even after salvation, um, our body seeks its only immediate satisfaction. You know, your body always wants to be immediately satisfied, doesn't it? It just, when you think about it, you just see a little kid all the time. There's a lot of immaturity in that. It's just constantly thinking, I want, I want, I want my way. I want it now. I need it now. I want it now. And if you have little children, you have to teach them to grow out of that. If you don't teach them to grow out of that, boy, they're going to have some major issues in their life later on. Amen. The body seeks its only immediate satisfaction. It always avo avoids discomfort. It like, it's lazy. It likes... It likes the foods, it likes the TVs, it likes laying around, it likes the people that wait on it hand and foot, and it whines when it doesn't get its way. That's the body, that's the flesh. You, every one of you guys' body does that, I can tell you. We all go through that. It doesn't like to sit still and read. It's, it's not about getting smarter, it's the soul that wants to get smarter. It doesn't want to know the things of God. It doesn't desire to learn, and it's able to man the, the body is able to manufacture sin, but it's never able to manufacture righteousness. That only comes from the spirit and the soul, Amen. That's the only thing that can manufacture righteousness and go look towards God. The body will never do it. So we are stuck with this body. Fighting it all the time. It's wants and it's desires. Woe is me. <laughs> Galatians 5.19 says this. And you can follow along here. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your flesh, the results are very clear. Now listen, as I read some of these things, Maybe God's going to prick your heart, and you're going to think, you know what, I struggle in that area. I struggle in that area. You know what, then these are areas that you really need to work on, you need to give to God, okay? Let's listen to this. When, you're, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. These are all the sensual sins. These are all the things that the, the devil attacks the biggest time. Matter of fact, when you read in the Bible, the children of Israel, what is the biggest thing that always caused them to trip up? Sexual, sensual sins. It always was. And that's a very, very strong force in the human body. And it always will be. So these are sins here that the devil is constantly trying to get us to look at, to get us to hunger after and thirst after, all these things right here. The next thing is idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? Idolatry is putting anything before God. Anything before God. See, listen, you and I were created to worship God. We were created to love people, and we were created to use our bodies to do the will of God. But in the world that we live today, it's just the opposite way around. What we do now is we use people we, instead of using our bodies to do the things for God. We love ourselves, and we worship things, don't we? Leaving God totally out of the picture. That is not the way God has it. And when you put things above God, whatever it may be, be it your family, be it your, your toys, your fun, all these things, material things, that is called idolatry. That's called idolatry. And the next thing is this, is sorcery. What is sorcery? Well, it's witchcraft. What's witchcraft? Well, if you look up the, the word for witchcraft, it actually comes out to be like pharmaceutical. I, I, what, it comes, what it means for witchcraft here is talking about drug addictions, drug abuse. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's obviously the, the worshiping the devil, but the thing is this, what it's talking about is the addictions, the drug addictions that happens in our lives. So when you see people who are addicted to drugs, they are actually involved in witchcraft. Isn't that amazing? And that's how God will judge them as well. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, division, even, I'm sorry, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. All these sins right here. If I named any of those, if you saw any of those up there that you struggle with, you know what? That is your flesh right there that has a stronghold in your life. And you and I need to deliver that and surrender that to God. And God will bring some healing in that. But that requires us to do something. That requires us to cooperate with God's will. Amen? Example. Who's ever heard of Samson? The guy, the strongest man in all the world. Okay, here, here's the thing with Samson. He knew what he was born. He knew why he uh, was born, that God was going to use him. That's why his hair was long. He was a Nazarite, and he knew that he had a special calling for God. But yet, even though he knew this, and even though he's trying to live it, this particular guy, Samson, he had these desires that he always gave in to. It was always the women. It was always the drinking, because the Bible talks about how he went to the parties. And it was always the, the things that his flesh desired. The Bible says that he wasn't ever supposed to touch anything dead or eat anything that's out of the dead anyway. You know what I'm talking about? He went and killed a lion. And when the lion died, uh, later he came back, and inside of it, bees 
built a hive in there and they made honey. So he couldn't stop himself. He wanted the honey. He wanted the honey. He gave in to his body's desires. He went over and grabbed the honey out of the carcass of a lion and ate it, what he was not supposed to do. We don't see a man who has any self-control whatsoever. We just see a man, we think, oh, wow, he did a lot for God. You know what? God had greater plans for this man, but because he did not have self-control, God could not use him to the full extent that he wanted to use him. The reason why he wanted Samson was so he could deliver all the children of Israel from the, the captivity of the Philistines. But you know what? That didn't happen. He only killed a lot of them, but they were still captive to them. Why? Because a man called of God could not have, did not have any self-control in his life. Do you see the destruction of that? Do you see how the devil has stolen from Samson what God wanted him to do? The devil wants to steal from you and I as well. There's certain things in our lives that we cannot seem to get over with. Why? Because we don't have the self-control. We've not totally surrendered it to God. And because of that, we will never be all that God has created us to be. Amen? We, do you want the devil to steal from you? No. Never give in to the devil those things that belong to God. Hallelujah. Give it to God. Give it to God. So living godly life requires us to master our flesh and to make it our servant rather than our flesh making itself master and everything else the servant. We are to master the flesh. And it's hard because you see how big it was? We've allowed our flesh to become strong. Listen to this. Whatever you feed will grow. So if you're constantly feeding the flesh all the things that it desires and it's wrong, and you know it's wrong, it will grow, and it will control the soul and the spirit. You don't want that to happen in your life. God is shouting. Listen, I, I heard someone say this. Whenever God shouts, you better be shouting. And I read scripture after scripture. I'm only going to give you a couple here, but God is shouting this, and this is what he's saying. In Romans 8, 6, it says this. The mind governed by the flesh, the soul that is governed by what the flesh wants to do, See, the soul wants to do certain things, but the flesh says, no, I want to do this, and you will follow me. Romans 8, 6 says this, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Hallelujah. See, God created us so that our spirit would control the soul, and our spirit would control the body. But the devil has flipped that around. He's perverted it, and it's just the opposite. As a matter of fact, when you hear people say, uh, I'm a body, soul, and spirit. No, no, no. You are a spirit with a soul inside of a body. You hear me? It's not the other way around. It's not the body in control of the soul and the spirit. You are a spirit that has a soul that's inside of a body. Matter of fact, the Bible, Paul talks about how the body is kind of like a tent. You know what I'm saying? You know, you look at a tent. I imagine their tents were a lot bigger, and he was a tent maker, but the, the tent was nothing. It was not glorious. It was, it was just a housing, a shell. But what was inside, the people who lived, that's what mattered the most. And so we, we shouldn't put so much emphasis and so much time and so much pleasure and so much energy and so much control to the flesh. Because the scripture says this, the mind governed by the flesh is death. Amen? Will you say that with me? The mind that is governed by the flesh is death. Amen. Romans 8, 13 says this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Let me read that again. I kind of stumbled over it. It says this. For if you live according to the flesh, if you do what the flesh wants to do, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you're going to leave, live. Then you're going to live. Whoa, whoa. What, what did you just say, Pastor Terry? That's right. We have to kill the body. We have to sacrifice the body. Everyone chase down Todd here at the end of the service, okay? <laughs> we have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Who's ever heard of pick up your cross and follow me? Yeah, Jesus knew what he's talking about because he knew that if we did not control the flesh, we could not serve him the way he wanted us to. Are you struggling in your service of God? Are you struggling in your relationship with God? Maybe your flesh is just a little too big for its britches. Hallelujah. Second Peter 1, verses 3 through 4 says this, By his divine power, and read this part with me that's underlined, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Wow. You don't have to be controlled by this. 
You don't have to be, I'm here to give you good news. First of all, and it's this, you do not have to live like that. God has given you everything you need to control this animal. God has given you everything you need to live a godly life, even though this body does not want to live a godly life. He's given you everything you need. You don't need anything else. Quit begging God for more of this, more of this. You've got all that you need. Now we just need to know what it is and operate in it. Amen? So many times people pray and pray and pray, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. God says, I've given you all you need. Use it. Amen? Learn it. Get in my Bible and understand what it is and proclaim it and claim my promises for your life. Obey my word and you will have victory and you will be able to live a godly life. Quit begging for things. Hallelujah. He, uh, in verse, how do we do that? How do we live a godly life? Well, we have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by the means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, we have, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape, I like this part, and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So when we surrender to God, God says, I will make sure that you escape your, your flesh's desires that will lead to death. I will make sure of that. He's already given us everything we need to live for a godly life. So when your flesh screams for the old lifestyle, you know, there's certain things in your life that you've given up. But do you guys ever realize your thoughts and your, your feelings, it still kind of longs for those things now and then? Remember the children of Israel, they're in the wilderness. They were just rescued from Egypt. And what happened there? They were calling back. Man, I wish we were back in Egypt. What are you stupid? You were a slave back then. You're free now. God is leading you to a promised land. Don't give up the discomfort right now so you can go back for that enjoyment that your flesh used to have, which led to death. Don't do that. It's the same way in our lives. Is there certain things in your life that you long for, that you used to live like, you used to be like, but now you're kind of longing for it? Don't do that. Don't do that. So when your flesh screams, I want the old lifestyle, crucify it. Crucify it. The Bible says this in Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, ready, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So <laughs> when your body says, I want to indulge in, you fill in the blank, I want to do this like I used to. I remember the days I feel good doing that. I want to do that. And you know that particular thing is wrong. It leads to death like I used to. Then what you're going to have to say to your body is say, get back on the cross. Who told you you could get back down? Get back up there. Do not come down off the cross. You do not control the things here. My spirit controls the will of God, what he wants for my life. I speak to you and say, you will not control it at all. Sometimes you have to speak to those. Who's ever had a child and you wanted it, that child to do right and all you sat there and just gave them an evil look and they never knew what you was talking about and they just kind of went on doing their thing? Well, you sometimes have to speak to that child. What are you doing? Oh, I'm getting back. Okay, I'm back in line, whatever. That's what we have to do sometimes to ourselves. Speak to it. In Jesus' name, I will not live like that. God has called me to something greater. God has called me to be holy, and I will not live like that anymore. I'm dead to you. You have no control over me. You have no authority over me. I give all my authority to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we're called to do. So tell your flesh, get back on the cross, who let you down, and who asked you anyway, okay? So remember, no temptation. No temptation. You may be tempted. You're gonna, these are going to be hard times. There's going to be times like, I, man, I, I remember those times, and I'm just kind of tempted right now because I'm either tired, or I'm bored, or I'm lonely, there's no accountability, whatever it is, no one's going to know. The Bible says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. Will you say it with me? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Here's the trouble. When we are drawn to certain things and we know it's wrong, God says, look, here's a way. I'm showing you a way out. The thing is, and I've done this many, many times, I thought, oh, I know a way out. I, I, that's what I should do. But I just sit there and think, well, I'll just, I'll hold on just a little bit longer and see which one of these two works out. I'm serious. I don't think of it as like God and the devil. I think of it as like, well, maybe God's not really, you know, I know what's right and what's wrong. I do, but yet I, I catch myself arguing, I want to do this particular thing, but then inside of me, it rises up, that's wrong, don't do it. That's the spirit saying, don't do it. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the little spirit saying, please, don't do it. 
And the big flesh is saying, shut up. You know, and the, the struggle goes on in between you. And you know what's the right thing to do. But set, yet you sit there and you think about it and you think about it just waiting. Well, maybe I'll wait for this spirit to be a little bit louder. Then I'll obey it. Who's ever done? You don't have to raise your hand. But I've done that sort of thing. I've done that sort of thing. And the thing is, it will always lead to death. Don't wait for that. God says, I'm not going to let you be tempted that you can't withstand it. There's not going to be some temptation that just comes over you that you cannot say no to. The trouble is, he gives us a way out, but we never take it. We turn our backs to it because we want to continue on in this way of sin. When God says to repent and turn towards him. So we can't do that anymore. God will give you a way out. Listen to me. If you're struggling, whatever it may be, God will give you a way out. You just have to obey it. You just have to react to it. Amen? So anyone who sins is sinning willfully. No one sins accidentally. Anyone who sins is sinning willfully. Hallelujah. So self-control is not about, self-control is not always about the don'ts. Sometimes it's about the do's. And I like what Alyssa had to say today. Sometimes we have to say to ourselves, you know what? I will worship God today. I will be in his word today. Amen? Amen. I will be about the things of my Father, and my thoughts will be on good things, as the Word of God says. It'll be on pleasant things. It'll be on holy things. It'll be on things of God. I will do those things. Sometimes you have to tell your body to do that as well, and your body goes, I don't want, I don't want, and that's where the Spirit has to kick the body's butt every now and then. Hallelujah, and that's where God comes in. God is very good at that, helping us kick our flesh's butt now and then. So when God wants you to dig into his Word and pray, and your flesh says, I'm tired I don't want to. Later. (laughs) When your flesh does that sort of thing, you tell your flesh to shut up. You have no say in the matter. And you know what? If it continues any longer like this, you're going to start fasting. (laughs) (laughs) If your flesh is constantly fighting you and fighting you and fighting you and you just feel that struggle and you're just like, I don't have victory. So you know what? Fine, that's it. We're fasting today. See what your flesh does. (laughs) No! It will fight you like crazy. Your flesh does not like pain. And not eating is pain to the flesh. That is why we sometimes fast, amen? So that we can have victory over certain areas of our lives. You are going to die in this area. I'm going to starve you to death. What we want to do is see that big body shrivel down to something like this. But God's, we still use that body. It's obedient to God's commands. And our spirit grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And our soul grows in its knowledge of God. Amen? And it's relationship with God. And now all of a sudden we become a, the creature that God has created us to be, someone who loves the Lord. And then when our flesh finally dies, we will be strong in what God has called us to do. We, will have, we have great rewards in heaven too, church. It's not just about getting in heaven. There's rewards to what God has called us to do here on earth. And the only way you could do it is when you surrender your heart to God and you go after him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So that's one of the ways, fast, be in the word, prayer. Galatians 5.16 says this, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Amen? Surrender to God. Pray. You're going to have to pray. I prayed that prayer. Well, pray it again. Pray it again. Obviously, your flesh isn't getting the, the idea here. Who's in control? You've got to let it know. Sometimes you've got to walk away. Sometimes you've got to set up barriers so that your flesh can't get into those areas. I like what Lester Simrall did. He used to go into uh, certain hotels, and when he walked in there, he'd have a TV. I, I don't know if it was Lester Simrall or not. It was some pastors. But they, they'd say, you know what? I want that TV taken out of my room. Well, okay, why is that? Because I don't want to be tempted by this thing. I don't want to be tempted by the, the free pornography that you put on here for anyone to get access to. I think it's wrong, so I want it out of here. See, that's when you don't give your flesh a chance. Amen? We sometimes got to set barriers. This is no fun preaching. Can I tell you that? But can I tell you, it's the truth. It's life. Anything else is death. And we want life, amen? And we have to obey it in every sense of the word. So don't let your unsaved, listen to this, don't let your unsaved, dying, decomposing flesh make the decisions for eternity for your spirit. Those who lack self-control, they allow their flesh to make decisions that it will never have to live through because it's going to die and go to the ground, but the spirit and the soul will have to live out the results of what the flesh told it to do. Isn't that? That's not fair. That's wrong. You ever meet someone like that? They get their way and everything, and all of a sudden they leave, and then you have to clean up after them. It's the same thing in our own bodies. If we give in to our flesh all the time and we die in our sins, the flesh is just going to decompose, and then the spirit and the soul 
is what's going to pay the price for eternity. Either in a lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, or in heaven, eternity with God. Amen? So I don't want what I know is wrong and it's dying and it's dead to make the decisions for me. That's, that's kind of like asking a, a gambler to take care of uh, your, uh, uh, what do you call it, your retirement fund. You know, your 401k, hey, gambler, here, here's my 401k. Make sure you make the right choices. Okay. You, you don't want to do that. You don't want to give the gambler that power. Don't give the gambler that power. Amen? You don't want to give a drug addict the power to administer the drugs to your children, do you? That would be foolish. And it's foolish also to allow our flesh to control the things that happen for our spirit and our soul. So don't give in to it. Don't give in to it. It will die. It will be loud. It will be noisy, but you just keep crucifying it. It keeps getting off the cross. It's some kind of zombie. I don't get it. But you have to keep killing it day and day and day and day and day. Daily, pick up your cross and take, get, hit that thing with the big ugly stick. Say, get down, down, down. Don't allow it to those things that you know that it wants to have. Eventually, it will become weaker and weaker and weaker. But you'll never get rid of it until the day that you die to the day that you die. So don't allow your flesh to make eternal decisions for you by uh, succumbing to the wrong thinking, by indulging in selfish actions, by entertaining with the, with the world's vomit. Don't, don't be entertained by the world's vomit on TV or wherever you're looking at. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery hostility, quarreling, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfishness, and selfish ambitions, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Do you struggle in any of those? God wants to set you free today. And his promises that we read at the very beginning, he will give you what you need to live a godly life. And nothing can overtake you. Nothing. The only thing that can defeat you, Christian, the only thing that can defeat a Christian, ready, is a Christian himself or herself by giving in to the things because they have already have a way out. They already can have victory because God has given us the victory. Amen? Ourselves is the only thing that can defeat us as a Christian. Don't let our flesh win anymore in Jesus' name. If I can have Jimmy come on up and play some music for me, you know it's that time, right? <laughs> Finally, I want to read to you, found in Romans, it says this, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, listen, he lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. You have the Spirit of the living God how Almighty living inside of you, Christian. You have that. That's phenomenal. That's power beyond measure. That's power beyond even imagination. We have that. So no little wimpy flesh is going to defeat me. You can't allow it can't allow it let me leave you with this last scripture and it says this and I'll bring this up on the board here in view of all this Christian make every effort to respond to God's promises respond to them add to your faith these things add to it add the 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 virtues add the knowledge add the self-control add these things and you will grow you will grow in the image of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, that's what we want. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supply or add to your faith a generous provision of moral excellence. You belong to God. You're no longer yourself. So act like God's children. Amen? And then add to moral excellence knowledge. Now gain some more knowledge. Get in the Word. Know your God. Know your Savior. Know Him intimately and know all about Him. Know Him personally. And when you do, all of a sudden, you won't be wanting to desire, uh, satisfy your flesh. You want to desire God. Your spirit will want to desire God. Amen? Know him. And then when you add that knowledge, add to that self-control. Now you have the power. Now you have everything you can have to live a godly life in Jesus' name. So in view of all this, supplement your faith with the generous provisions continuously of moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge, and with knowledge, self-control. Amen? You can do it. I can do it. This world needs a church that's, you know, this world has seen enough of Christians who do not have self-control. Haven't they? We see it spread across the papers. They can't wait. When they see a Christian who doesn't have self-control and they get caught, they plaster it all over the paper. But you know what? Check this out. You don't see so much of that anymore. Why? Because it's old news. We need to just turn that thing around. 
we need to crucify that flesh daily. Amen? We need to be about saying, God, I need self-control in my life. Amen? Would you please bow your heads? I want to pray for you.